the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Let us pray. Lord, we ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone, O Lord, are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We, we have a lot going on today, right? It's, um, you may have noticed, like I said, that the liturgy is a little different. Uh, we have this baptismal font out here because we're, we're doing a baptism today. Uh, one of our children that wasn't able to be baptized at Pentecost, we've, we're going to do that today. Um, we've also, it's a family Sunday, and so we've got our youngest disciples. Our kids are, are here with us in the room today. Hello, kids. It's good to see you. Um, and then, in addition to that, as if that wasn't enough, it's also, I'm told, a holiday weekend. <laughs> now, listen, y'all, the holiday was on Thursday. I feel like we're stretching it a little bit here, but, you know, America. Um, no, it, it's good to have, a, a little national pride is a good thing right, uh, for your community, for the society that you're a part of. Um, it's, it's especially a good thing if your pride for your country is for a place that's actually a country. Um, I grew up next to Texas. <laughs> now, some of you didn't quite get that, so let me explain. If you've, if you've never had the privilege of being within earshot of someone from Texas, uh, they have a pronounced national pride, the fact that their state is not a nation notwithstanding. They're proud of it. They want you to know about it. Um, I have some friends that went, they, uh, they grew up in Texas. They're Texans, right? But they went to college outside of the state. Uh, and they were, they were telling me the other day, when they were in college, the school that they went to had one of these student centers with, centers with like a large rotunda, you know, like a 30-foot ceiling kind of thing. And so they had, this is not original, lots of schools do this. They had hung flags from all of the countries, countries that their students were from. Right? So you had like Brazil and Mexico and England and Wales and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, well, they, they, didn't, they didn't have a Texas flag. And this, my, my friends, you know, I mean, the only reason they could think of is maybe the school can't afford a Texas flag. Fortunately, we've got an extra. And so they didn't want to shame anybody, but they did want to give this to the school. And so they got in in the middle of the night. You know, this is a nice, quiet, sort of don't disturb anybody. One of them happened to have a key. They got into the building in the middle of the night. And they <laughs> hung the Texas flag right in the middle of all of the other countries. And over the top of it, they wrote, remember the Alamo. <laughs> well, after, <laughs> after a little while, eventually maintenance found the flag, they took it down, and then it's a game, right? So then it's, we're going to put it up, see how long it can last until maintenance takes it down again, uh, just back and forth. Being a Texan was really important to their sense of identity. Uh, you know, there are other things that make claims on our identities. I'm, I'm an American. I'm a Bulldogs fan. I'm, I'm also a minister and a father and an amateur sailing enthusiast and, you know, all these other things, Right? Um, those things all don't have the same weight. We, we organize them internally, right? There's some of these things that are more important to me than others. Uh, researchers call this identity salience, right? The way that we organize our sort of competing identities. But then once we've got those in an order, it gives us our sort of sense of who we are. It gives me my marching orders. It helps me make decisions, right? If the bulldogs are on, but my wife also needs help with something, the decision should be really easy, y'all. <laughs> It, we have all of these different things that we belong to that then organize for us how we're going to behave. This is true of all of us. We, as people, make sense of our lives through these different hats that we wear. But here's a question. What happens when those things begin to fall apart? What happens when the uh, cause that I've built my life, my life around or the role I've organized my world around disappears or becomes unattainable? Or thinking of causes, what's worse, the light comes on and we realize this was a sham. Who, who am I in those moments, right? When those things begin to find, fall apart, we find ourselves in a kind of existential crisis. What I mean is a kind of identity crisis. If I'm not this, if I never become that, then what does my life mean? And we start grasping for a new identity in a marketplace that is full of them. 
Am I this? Am I that? Who am I? Today is all about identity. Like I said in a little bit, a young man is going to be baptized, which has a whole lot to do with his identity, right? His identity changes in baptism. But even in addition to that, our readings today are about identity. The gospel reading we, um, is, is particularly focused on this question of identity. The crowd starts by asking, who is John? And they're wondering, is he the Christ? So who is John? Who is the Christ? And then we as the reader, of course, who is Jesus? And we might add on top of that this other question, given the context of what we're doing today, why is Jesus being baptized? And what does that have to do with our baptism? We have these questions about identity. Well, we're going to look at that a little today, but before we do, we have to back up. We have to back up from Jesus, back through John the Baptist, all the way back to the crowd. And when we go all the way back to the crowd, we can work our way forward, seeing if we can find the answers to these questions. Who is the Christ? Why does Jesus get baptized? And what does that have to do with us? So, beginning then at the top of our reading at verse 15, as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. The people were in expectation and they're questioning in their hearts whether John might be the Christ. You know, this is a really remarkable verse. It gives us an insight into what's going on in the crowd, into the kind of existential chaos that we were just talking about a moment ago. When things you thought weren't supposed to happen happen, And when things that you thought were supposed to happen don't, you begin looking for answers, right? And you might even find yourself desperate enough to go to places you never thought you'd go, like to a madman in the wilderness. You know, we've got the benefit of hindsight when it comes to John, right? We know that he was a prophet. We know that he was was a good guy. We, We know that the Lord was using him. They didn't have any of that hindsight. He's a crazy man. He's out in the wilderness, he's, he's living off the land, he's covered in animal skins, he's rude to anyone who comes out to him, and he's demanding that everyone wash in this muddy river. By the way, the Jordan is not pristine, right? It's, it's muddy and it's dirty. This is why Naaman in the Old Testament, when you know, Elijah said, go wash in the river, he said, no, that's gross. John is a crazy man. But when the world's crazy, you'll go anywhere for answers. And so they've run to John. They've gone to John looking for the thing that they've lost. What is it that they're looking for? What is it that they've they've lost that they're going to John to find? You know, last year I had the the privilege of being in the children's ministry for several months in a row. Uh, We we had had kind of a shortage of, of volunteers, and so I ended up down there. It was wonderful, right? I get to spend time with you kids. Y'all are a lot of fun. It was great. Um, but also during that time, you know, uh, it's true what they say, you never, you've never mastered something until you've learned how to teach it to a child, right? And so during those times, week in, week out, we were going through the story of Abraham. Uh, if you don't know, the way that our children's ministry works is we go through the entire story of Scripture every year. Uh, as you get older, as you go through different stages of the children's ministry, we go back to the beginning, we add in more stories. Well, uh, Miss Holly, who runs our children's program, uh, put me in, in charge of teaching the story of Abraham. And so we were going over and over it again and again. While I was down there looking at the story of Abraham, one of the things that sort of came up is that this is really the story of Israel's identity. This is the story that Israel would go back to when they wanted to understand who they were It's about Abraham being called by God, being called out of the land of his fathers into a new place, and God makes a covenant with him, which is a kind of promise, right? And children, I wonder if you remember the three things that God promises Abraham that he's going to do for him. He says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to make you a people, and I'm going to be your God. In other words, I'm going to give you my presence to dwell with you. I'm going to give you a land, Abraham. I'm going to make you a people, and I'm going to be your God. I'm going to be with you. Well, the Israelites carried those promises with them. Like I said, this became incorporated into their sense of identity, 
And um, when they went, when Moses brought them out of Egypt and Joshua brought them into the promised land, and when David sat on the throne and united them as a kingdom, and when Solomon built the temple and the glory of the Lord filled it, this was it. This was the fulfillment of that identity. They knew who they were. They knew what God was doing in the world, right? But then what happens? Things go horribly wrong. The people begin to break the covenant, right? They, they don't, they're not faithful to the Lord. And what happens? They lose the blessings. They lose the land. They lose the kingdom. They lose the temple. And so you, you fast forward to our readings today, and, and what do you find? Well, they're in the land again, but it belongs to the Romans. There's a king sitting on the throne, but he's not the son of David, and they've rebuilt the temple, they've built a new one, but the glory of the Lord has not filled it. And what's worse, it has been 400 years since God has sent a prophet. I can't help but wonder if in those moments what came back to mind from the scriptures was not the promises of Abraham, but the prophetic words of Hosea. Hosea, who named them Jezreel, Lo Ruhama, and Lo Ami. You are scattered and unloved and not a people. They're desperate, desperate to figure out who they are, desperate to figure out what they should do, and so they go to the water. And that's where John is, right? John's by the River Jordan. And what's more, the water is always the place that God has met them when he's begun to work. Think about the very first story of Scripture, the very, very first story of Scripture. God brings life out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord hovers over the deep, and then he calls forth life. Think about when God rescues the people from Egypt. Moses leads them through the Red Sea. And when Joshua brought them into the promised land, he did it by splitting the waters of the Jordan so that the people could walk through. And so they go back to the water. And John is standing by the waters of the Jordan, and the people have come out to meet him, hoping that maybe, just maybe, God will bring them through the water once again. And of course, in all these old stories, God has sent someone to lead them, someone to guide them through the water, it was Noah, or it was Moses. It was, it was Joshua, or it was the judges. It was the kings. But always there was someone that God would bring in to lead them back into his promises. And so the people began to wonder, maybe this is the man God has sent to save us. Maybe this is the one appointed by God. That's what the Christ means. The one who's anointed by God, who will bring us back into the land. But John's not the man right? And come to think of it, neither were any of the others. Moses doesn't lead them into the promised land. Do you remember that? He doesn't, he doesn't go in. Joshua doesn't clear the land of their enemies. When you get to the end of Joshua, there are still enemies in the land. The judges don't unite them as a people, and the kings end up being their, um, their own undoing. And even the prophets, the prophets who so earnestly called to the people when they were going down the wrong road, couldn't get the people to take the right road. No, John's not the man, but he is a sign on the road. He, like every other prophet, can point you in the right direction that you need to go, but he can't bring you in. And so, and he tells the people this. He says, it's not me. And so the people are left waiting on the banks of the Jordan, waiting for entry into the promised land, waiting for God to be with them. And there we find Jesus right in the midst of them. Jesus comes to be baptized. And John, we see this in Matthew's gospel, John sees Jesus and he knows what's going on and he asks the question that all of us would like to ask, why? Right? If this is the Lord's anointed, why are you coming to be baptized? You should, I should be baptized by you, John says. And Jesus gives this really enigmatic answer. He says, let it be, John, for this is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Now, this is one of those, you know, like with, with answers like that, who needs questions, right? This is, what, what on earth does that mean? Let it be, John, but this is fitting for the fulfillment of all righteousness. I want to spend a little time here this morning 
I want to spend a little time trying to understand what it is that Jesus is saying, because if we can get that, we actually can begin to answer our other questions. Who is the Christ? Why is Jesus baptized? What does that have to do with us? The answer to the fulfillment of righteousness has to do with promises. It's like in 2 Corinthians where Paul says, uh, God did everything he did so that we might become the righteousness of God. That doesn't mean so that we can become like good deeds for God. What it means is we might become the living proof that God keeps his word. The vindication of God. God has said he's going to do all these things and now he's done them and we're the proof of it. We might become the righteousness of God. Well, the same thing is happening here. The the reformer Martin Luther said all of the promises of the Old Testament point to the baptism of Jesus. All of the promises of the Old Testament find the beginning of their fulfillment in the baptism of Christ. And so Jesus says to John, you must baptize me because in me everything that God has promised is being fulfilled. Here's what I mean. Here's a little homework for you. I know a lot of you thought, you know, we're grown folks. We don't have homework, but the kids know, right? We still have homework. Go and read Psalm 2, right? This week, go read Psalm 2. It's short. It's just like 12 verses. What you'll find is that Psalm 2 is a promise. It's a promise to Israel that one day there will be a king who will sit on the throne and rule over the nations. And right at the beginning of Psalm 2, do you know what it says? It says, you are my beloved son. And then go to Isaiah. We read part of Isaiah 42 today. Read the rest of it. And what you'll find is that Isaiah is a, is a story, we call this the, the poem of the suffering servant. It's a story about this character who is, is faithful to the covenant in the way that Israel should be and who ends up carrying the weight of all of Israel's sin. And right at the beginning of Psalm 42, it says, behold my servant in whom I am well pleased. You have these promises that God has given. And do you see how when Jesus comes up out of the water, what does, what does the Father say to him? In his declaration of love for the Son, he says, that you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You see how these begin to be woven together around Jesus. But there's something more. There's something thematically prior to either of those promises, chronologically that's prior to Isaiah and even prior to David. It's a story. It's a story about Abraham. Now, I'm going to tell you the story, but kids, listen, I got to warn you, it's kind of gross. All right, so there's like, there's like dead animal parts and all sorts of, you know, there's blood everywhere. It's a messy story. Is it all right? Okay. Here's, here's the story. You see, before the people passed through the Jordan and entered into the promised land, before the people passed through the Red Sea and received the law of Moses, before there was even a people, there was Abraham, the man with whom God made a promise. I mentioned earlier that God had, uh, had promised Abraham three blessings, right? He said, I'll give you a land, I will make you a people, and I will be with you. Well, how do you make a promise? Kids, how do, you, how, do you make, how do you seal the deal on a promise, right? You've said you're going to do this for me in exchange for my, uh, my you know, Hot Wheels car. What do you, you know, you pinky swear, right? You can pinky swear, or when I was a kid, you cross my heart, hope to die, stick a thousand needles in my eye, right? We like, this is serious business. You've got your own versions of these. Now, we, you know, when you're grown ups, listen, we do this in a much more like, it's just a much more boring way. We go get lawyers, right? They write up, we sign these papers that are full of legalese that we don't understand and we hope it doesn't come back to bite us. Well, I'm happy to tell you in Abraham's day, things were much more straightforward, much more like the way that we made promises when we knew that it mattered that we kept them. Here's how you made a promise in Abraham's day. If I'm a king and I, you want something from me, you want my protection, you want access to my army or to my resources, I've got something that you need, we'll make a deal. Here's how it'll go. You promise to be faithful to me and I promise you these blessings. And what I'm going to say is I want you to go get some animals and I want you to cut them in half. All right. And you're going to put half over here and half over there. A little bit of goat on this side, a little bit of goat over here. Head of a cow, bottom of a cow. You see what I mean? It's bloody. And you make an aisle. 
and you walk through the middle of the aisle and you declare, if I should break faithfulness with the king, if I should not hold up my end of the bargain, let me be like these animals. Now, here's the really important thing. I don't walk through. I'm the one giving you the blessing. You want stuff from me. You're going to take this promise upon yourself, right? It's messy, but you get the point. There's not a lot of legalese to hide behind here. The one receiving the blessing binds themselves in blood to the king who gives the blessing. All right, now go with me to Genesis 15, or go read it later this week, and here's what you'll find. Abraham asked God, God's made all these promises. He said, God, how do I know you're going to keep your promise? And in verse 9, the Lord said to Abraham, bring me a heifer, which is like a cow. Bring me a heifer, bring me a goat, a ram, all of those three years old, and then bring me a dove and a young pigeon. And Abraham knows exactly what to do with them. He goes and he gets them and says, Abraham brought all these and he cut them in two. And he piled them up against each other, one on one side, one on the other. He laid them down on the ground. You see, Abraham understood the ceremony. And you, listen, you have all these carcasses. Like I said, it's bloody. It's a mess. It's out in the sun. We're in the Middle East, so things are hot. The birds are coming. It's as Abraham goes and chases off the birds. Everything is set for the ceremony. It's going to happen that evening. And then something unexpected happens. Does anybody remember what it is? He faints. Abraham falls asleep right there when he's supposed to act, right when he was supposed to swear himself to the deal. It says, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. Behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. Y'all, this is a weird story. If you don't know what a smoking fire pot is or what the torch is doing, here's what I'd recommend. Go down to the cathedral in Loganville on a high feast day. Go down for Easter or Pentecost. And if you do, here's what you'll likely see. Is you'll see an, a young acolyte, kind of like Sutton did for us today carrying the cross. You'll see one carrying a candle, a torch, following a priest who's swinging what's called a thurifer. It's a pot with live coals in it and incense billowing out. A smoking fire pot and a torch are the liturgical symbols of God's presence among his people. Do you see what's happened here? When it came time for Abraham to swear fealty to the covenant, God said, you, you can't play at this table. I'm making this deal with you, but you are not capable of fulfilling it. I will bind myself to it. I will become both the blessing giver and the guarantor of its reception. I will make you faithful to the covenant with my own body. Sometimes when uh, at the church we're doing weddings, I, uh, I get to do the premarital counseling. It's a lot of fun. Maybe. I don't know. You can ask somebody who's done it. Uh, I think it's a lot of fun. When we do that, I, at the very beginning, I present this model. There's a sort of an image that I use of a house, the sound relationship house, and we talk through the different aspects of marriage, but right at the foundation of the house, the things holding the house up are two things, trust and commitment. But here's the thing, is that trust gets broken, right? Even in little ways, we break trust constantly with one another. I told you I was going to do this, but then I didn't do it. And what I'll tell them is I'll say, listen, if you break trust, we can rebuild it. There are things we can do. We can go through the hard work of rebuilding this marriage. The thing I cannot give you is commitment. That's what makes a marriage not a business deal, right? Is that what I do in, in marriage that I should never do in business is I say, you are my person. I've bound myself to you. And no matter what happens, I'm holding on to you, right? God takes what is a business deal with Abraham and he makes it a marriage. He says from the beginning, I will ensure that this happens. I will ensure the fulfillment of the promises that I'm giving you. 
Fast forward to today's readings. Why is Jesus in the water? Why is Jesus being baptized for the forgiveness of sins when he doesn't have any sins to be forgiven of? Do you see it? He's doing the same thing that he did with Abraham. He's doing the same thing he's been doing from the beginning. He's saying, I'm going to take your place. So when Jesus emerges from the water, he does so both as Israel's God and as Israel's king. This is my beloved son. He does so both as the righteous Lord and the suffering servant in whom my heart is pleased. As the one who promises and as the one who faithfully obeys. And here's what this means for you and for me and for our baptism. In baptism, you are brought into the covenant. In baptism, you are brought into the promises. The Lord promised Abraham a kingdom. He promised him a people, and he promised him that he would be with them. In your baptism, you are incorporated into the people of God. In your baptism, you are born into the kingdom of God. And in baptism, you are sealed with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God that comes to live inside you to continue the work he has, been, he has begun to bring you all the way home. You'll, like I said, we asked at the very beginning, who am I? What do, we asked in, in terms of roles or causes or movements, what do I belong to? What do I identify with? But in Christ, what you really have is the inverse of that question. You see, you don't just need something to identify with, something to su subscribe to or to incorporate into yourself alongside all of your other identities. Like Abraham, you aren't able to guarantee the covenant. What you need is for someone to claim you, for someone to take your place, for someone to come and identify himself with you. In his baptism, Christ is doing that. He's joined you in death, so that in your baptism, you might join him in life. As one commentator says, and we'll close with this, because of the baptism of Jesus, we are recipients of all that belongs to the Son. In baptism, we stand on the banks of the Jordan River and we hear the words of the Father, you are my beloved children in whom I am well pleased. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.